Colossians, stand up please when you have it. Say word. word. John chapter 15, verse 5, Colossians 1, 13 through 14. John reads this like this. I am the vine, mm -hmm. you are the branches. Mm -hmm. If you remain in me and I in you, you will bear much fruit. Apart from me, you can do nothing. Colossians 1, 13 and 14, for he has rescued us from the dominion of darkness and brought us into the kingdom of his, of the son he loves, in whom we have redemption, the forgiveness of sin. You may be seated in the presence of the Lord. May God add understanding to his already blessed word. The Declaration of Independence is the statement adopted by the Second Continental Congress meeting at Pennsylvania State House Independence Hall in Philadelphia on July 4th, 1776, which announced that the 13 American colonies then at war with the Kingdom of Great Britain regarded themselves as 13 newly independent sovereign states and no longer under British rule. Instead, they formed a new nation, the United States of America. John Adams was a leader in pushing for independence, which was passed on July 2nd with no opposing vote cast. A committee of five had already drafted the formal declaration to be ready when Congress voted on independence. The term Declaration of Independence is not used in the document itself. John Adams persuaded the committee to select Thomas Jefferson to compose the original draft of the document, which Congress would edit to produce the final version. The declaration was ultimately a formal explanation of why Congress had voted on July 2nd to declare independence from Great Britain, more than a year after the outbreak of the American Revolutionary War. The next day, John Adams wrote to his wife, Abigail, the second day of July, 1776, will be the most memorable epoch in the history of America. But Independence Day is actually celebrated on July 4th, mm -hmm. the date that the Declaration of Independence was approved. So this weekend, we celebrated our country's Declaration of Independence. We celebrated the 4th of July. We celebrated our Independence Day. In a sense, we celebrated our country's birthday. Now, for years, I thought this day was nothing but time to have ribs, potato salad, and look at some fireworks. And we definitely had fireworks last night, the night before that, the night before that, the night before that. I'm so sick of hearing boom cracking like my poor dog running to the base. And I'm tired of it. But the day is really significant in our country's history. It is the day that we declared that we did not need to be under the rule of Great Britain, that we were free to be our own country. We wanted our freedom and we took it. So we are one of the greatest nations in the world and, and in the greatest nation in the world, slaves were not free until June 19, 19 1865, two years after Lincoln signed the Emancipation Proclamation. That is why we celebrated Juneteenth a few weeks ago. And in the greatest nation in the world, we still have our problems. We, we still have to battle racism. We're still battling bigotry. We're still battling discrimination. We're still battling hatred. We're still battling poverty. We're still battling police brutality. We're still battling inequality. We're still battling racial injustice. We're still battling racial suppre voter suppression. Amen. I'm still trying to figure out how Kentucky got away with eliminating 2,900 voter sites. And, and, and it's crazy what's going on in this nation. And we may not be happy with everything that's going on in our nation, but I, but I don't think we want to be anywhere else either. Because here we are free. We enjoy the luxury of freedom. We, we can go where we want to go sometimes, do not do what we want to do most of the times, marry who we want to marry and worship any God we want to worship. I mean, that is the idea anyway, the American dream. Wow, think about that for a moment. That, that kind of freedom can be scary. But with freedom, uh, we are free to choose. And, and today, I choose to be totally dependent on God. With that being said, I, I, 
I depend on. I know that I'm going to be totally dependent on God. I need to depend on God. With all the darkness in the world, Minister Sam, I need to depend on God. With hell breaking loose in my life, I need to depend on God. With the rise of racial unrest in our nation, I need to depend on God. With the uncertainty that COVID-19 has brought, I need to be dependent on God. With all the madness going on in Washington, D.C., I need to be dependent on my God. With a friend and a colleague going through the ringer because of a Facebook post. I need to be dependent on God with the true colors of friends and loved ones beginning to show. Oh, you thought it was really your friend until you see what they posted, what they're saying, their opinion on this and that. They actually don't have your back at all. I need to be dependent on God. So today I'm making my declaration of dependence. Today is my dependence day. As a matter of fact, every day is my dependence day because every day Day I'm depending on God because I cannot do this thing called life on my own. So for the month of July, we'll be talking about our dependence day because every day you should be depending on God. There are at least four things that I would like to share with you in the month of July that we depend on God for. And the first thing that we depend on God for is his forgiveness. Everybody say forgiveness. Yeah. Let's look at the text. First, let's look at the passage in the Gospel of John, the disciple whom Jesus loved. And in this chapter of John, Jesus is talking to his disciples. He is basically telling them that I am the vine and my father is the gardener. And the gardener is going to cut off every branch that does not bear fruit. That, what is that saying? That's saying if you ain't doing nothing, you're going to get cut off. Amen. He, he reassures the disciples that as long as you remain in me and I remain in you, you will bear fruit. But apart from me, you can't do nothing. In other words, you need me. You must depend on me. And if you depend on me, I will never leave you or forsake you. We can do nothing without God. Does anybody believe that this morning? You mean, I mean, I tried it on my own. I, I tried to do it myself. I, I tried to do it my way. Raise your hand if you tried to do it your way. And it didn't work out. It messed up. It went awry. It went south. It went all bad. You tried to make a situation better than instantaneously got worse. You put your foot in your mouth. I'm good for putting my feet in my mouth. It's usually both of them too, it's not just one. Amen. But we need God. Amen. We need him. Amen. That's what first, that's what John was talking about. That's what Jesus was talking about in the Gospel of John. Now in Colossians verses 13 through 14, Paul is addressing the Christian church in Colossae and he tells them how thankful he is for each and every one of them and how grateful he is that they have heard the gospel story and believed. He expressed to them how him and Timothy had not stopped praying for them since he heard that they believed. He was excited. He planted the church and they was doing what he planted the church to do. They was living for Jesus. Amen. And, and him and Timothy was praying for that church. And he wanted to reassure them of their faith and remind them that God has rescued them from the dominion of darkness and brought them into the kingdom of the son he loves in whom we have redemption, the forgiveness of sins. Now, Paul wanted them to know that because they believed, because of your faith, in, in, in God, you have been rescued from darkness and brought into the kingdom of the Son. You have been redeemed. Your sins have been forgiven. Your, your, I thought I'd get a better amen right there. Your, your sins have been forgiven. I, I don't know about you, but knowing that my sins are forgiven gives me a freeing feeling that I cannot explain. It's like a huge weight lifted off my life. Does anybody know what I'm talking about? Amen. So, so I mean, it's like, oh man, you can pay me at that? You know what I did? And you still love me? Yeah. So as we thread the needle between these two scriptures, we can see that we can do nothing without God. We depend on God. And one of the things we depend on God for is his forgiveness. Let me share this story with you real quick. One rainy afternoon as I was driving along one of the main streets of town, um, taking those extra precautions necessary when the roads are wet and slick. This lady must be living in Columbus because I swear every time the particip participation fall from the ground, y'all lose your, your precipitation. They lose their mind. They act like they can't drive. They don't have all weather tires and they got their flashes on because it's raining. I'm like, oh my goodness, it's just rain. Get out my way. I'm, I'm sorry, that's not in the story. Suddenly, 
My son Matthew spoke up from his relaxed position in the front seat. Mom, I'm thinking of something. This announcement usually meant he had been pondering some fact for a while and was now ready to expound all his seven-year-old mind had discovered. I was eager to hear. What are you thinking, I asked Matthew. The rain began. It's like sin, and the windshield wipers are like God wiping our sins away. After chills bump raced up my arms, I was able to respond. That's really good, Matthew. Then my curiosity broke in. How, how far would this little boy take this revelation? So I asked, do you notice how the rain keeps on coming? What does that tell you? Matthew didn't hesitate one moment with his answer. We keep on sinning, and God keeps on forgiving us. I, I, I will always remember this whenever I turn my wipers on. Isn't it comforting to know that God keeps on forgiving us? Is there anybody in the room excited about the fact that God keeps on forgiving us? Us. No matter what we've done, he forgives us. No matter how many times we've done it, no matter how many times we messed up, no matter how many mistakes we make, no matter how many times we relapse, no matter how many times we fall off the wagon, no matter how many times we go back to the place we know we should not go, no matter how many times we backslide, no matter how many times we disappointment, it does not matter. God always forgives us because God will always love us. Every time I think about that, God will always love us. I think about that Dolly Parton song that Whitney Houston made so much better. Yeah. <laughs> I will always love you. Amen. And his forgiveness does three things for us. First thing God's forgiveness does for us is it gives us freedom. Which is such an appropriate point the day after the celebration of Independence Day. God forgives us, gives us freedom. Remember how free you felt the first time you left home when you were on your own? It was you against the world and you were ready to take it all on. Well, the freedom that we receive from God's forgiveness is so much more liberating. That is why we love to sing that song, I'm free. Praise the Lord, I'm free. I'm no longer bound, no more chains holding me. My soul is resting. It's such a blessing. Praise the Lord. Hallelujah, I'm free. Anybody free this morning? He, 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 anybody free this morning? Are, are your chains broken? Is your bondage broken? Has you been set free? Are you loose in your spirit? Because the freedom that comes from forgiveness, here are three things that we are free from. We are free from our former selves. Well, y'all quite act like y'all ain't got no former self. Well, maybe it's not former. <laughs> Woo, maybe you still is some of that stuff. We are free from our former selves. You are a new creation. The old has passed. The new has come. You are free from the person you used to be. You are free from the things you used to do. You don't have to be that person anymore. You don't have to do those things anymore. That is the beautiful thing. Let me be a little transparent for a moment. The old Brian, not Pastor B, not PB, not Pastor Brian K. Hall, not Reverend Brian Kelly Hall, and not him, but old Brian, the one they used to call B, the low, down, dirty, rotten scoundrel, amen, that took advantage of every possible situation and circumstance, I could. I was always on the hustle, y'all. I was always trying to figure out some way to get over, the way to get a little extra cash. I didn't break the law, really. You know, I was in the gray area. You know, I kind of tight, rocked that tight rope between, ah, I could go to jail if I get caught, but maybe they'll give me a stop on the road. But I am black, so I probably wouldn't go to jail. Anyway, <laughs> y'all know what I'm saying. I always, you know, I always caution myself not to get too deep on what I did because I don't want to give my children any ideas. <laughs> Dad, you did that. Oh man, maybe I'll try. That's why I don't go to. But y'all know what I'm talking. I did some stuff. You know what I mean? But he took me and he made something beautiful out of my life. He looked beyond my faults and he saw my needs. We are free from our former selves. But not only are we free from our former selves, we're free from the facade. We, you know, we don't have to put on a show anymore. We don't have to fake it till we make it anymore. We don't have to act like we have it all together. What are you saying, Pastor Brian? I'm saying we can be vulnerable now. We, we can be open. And we can let people in. We can let people help us. We can let people see that we are hurting. We don't have to front like we have it all together. That's what we used to call it when I was growing up, Brother Phil. We used to call it fronting because we used to put on a front and, and try to act like something we were not. We try to act like we were tough when we were weak. Try to act cool when we was a nerd. Try to act hard when we were soft. Try to act sophisticated when we didn't know how to spell sophisticated. You know you spelled it with an F. Like trying to act good when 
you were not, when you were really bad. I, I thank God that we are free from the facade. We don't have to fake it. No more people would come around and be like, how you doing? How you doing? How you doing? How you doing? And that wasn't you at all. You, you was a what up person. But you fake your fault. Amen. We don't got to do that no more. We are free from the facade. We are free from our former selves. We are free from the facade. And we are free from fretting. And fretting is just another way of saying worrying. We don't have to worry. As a matter of fact, that, that, that this is what it says in the Bible in Matthew 6, 25 through 34. I thought the Bible could say it better than I could. Therefore, I tell you, do not worry about your life, what you will eat or drink or about your body, what you will wear. Is not life more than food and the body more than clothes? Look at the birds of the air that do not sow or weep or store away in barns, and yet your heavenly Father feeds them. Are you not much more valuable than they are? Can any one of you, by worrying, add a single hour to your life? And why do you worry about clothes? See how the flowers of the field grow? They do not labor or spin, yet still I tell you that not even Solomon in all his splendor was dressed like one of these. If that is how God clothes the grass of the field which is here today and tomorrow thrown in the fire, will he not much more clothe you? You of little faith. So do not worry, saying, what shall we eat? What shall we drink? Or what shall we wear? For the pagans run after, run after these things, and your heavenly Father knows that you need them. But seek ye first the kingdom of God and his righteousness, and all these things will be given to you as well. Therefore, do not worry about tomorrow, for tomorrow will worry about itself. Each day has enough trouble of its own. I cannot say it any better than the word of God. What in the world are you worried about? We are free from fretting. Amen? So the first thing God's forgiveness gives us is freedom. And the second thing that God's forgiveness gives us is a fresh start. How many of you people in the room today can say and honestly testify that you're thankful for a fresh start? Things got pretty bad out there when you were, we were out there doing our own thing. Things got a little bit out of control. We made some terrible, horrible, regrettable mistakes that put us in some compromising positions. We were in some unbelievable situations and circumstances. So thank Thank God for your fresh start. You got to redo, a, a do-over, a reset. You know, you got a clean slate. Amen. And I'm so excited about it. Here are three things you can do with your fresh start. Since you have your fresh start, you can begin to formulate. What in the world are you talking about? Just give me a minute and I'll explain. You need a fresh start. You have a fresh start. So what are you going to do with your fresh start? You, wanna, you don't want to go back to what you were doing before your fresh start. Amen. So you need to formulate. You need to make a plan. You need to set some goals and objectives for your life and plan out how you're going to reach those goals and objectives. It's not going to happen overnight, but if you are committed to the plan and place the plan in God's hand, as a matter of fact, don't just place the plan in God's hand. Don't even make the plan without consulting God first. That way you can make sure that your plan is in alignment with God's plan for your life. That is the problem most of us have. We make plans without consulting God. We make plans without considering God's point of view. We make plans that are not consistent with God's plans for our life. That's why people say we make plans and God laughs. Our fresh start allows us to formulate. Y'all know what I'm talking about. You make plans and nothing work out according to your plans and God's looking like, I think that they would go do that. They they would, I ain't, that's not what I have for them. I got something else over here for them. They're trying to go over here. That's why you need to consult God, amen, before you start making your plans, Amen. So our fresh start allows us to formulate and then our fresh start allows us to facilitate. This is when we put the plan into action. It's great to write a plan. The Bible even tells us to write the vision and make it plain. But the, but the plan will do us no good if we do not put the plan in motion. Amen. We also, uh, that, why else would James say faith without works is dead? You had the faith to make the plan, now have the faith to put the plan into action. This is going to require some action on your part. Don't just make the plan and put it on the shelf. As a matter of fact, someone in the room today has a plan already and you put it on the shelf. God told me to tell you to get the plan out, dust it off, and get to work. Amen. It's not over. You still have time. It's not too late to start the business, to go back to school, to get out of debt, to buy the house, to get the car, to answer your call, to write the book, to write the song 
to write the grant, to start the program, to get involved. It's not too late. Our fresh start allows us to facilitate, amen? Our fresh start allows us to formulate. Our fresh start allows us to facilitate. And then our fresh start allows us to fascinate. This is what I love about God. He forgives us, gives us freedom from our former selves, the facade and the fretting, and, and he gives us a fresh start by allowing us to formulate, facilitate, and with that gives us the ability to fascinate everyone around us because when we become all that God has called us to be, when we formulate and facilitate with God on our side, this is going to fascinate the world around you. And they are going to ask and wonder, how in the world could this happen to you? And that's when you lift your hands, shout hallelujah, and give God glory, and which leads me to my third and final point. Let's stop right there because you know when you fascinate people, it ain't about you. It's about God. So a minute people start giving you praise and patting you on the back, you need to point them to Jesus because it didn't have anything to do with you but all about the God that resides inside of you. Yeah, I accomplished this, but there's no way I would have done it if Jesus wasn't in me, by my side, pushing me, prodding me, empowering me, giving me the vision and making it plain. It's all about Jesus. I'm just a vessel. Give God the glory. Amen? So the first thing that forgiveness gives us is freedom. The second thing that forgiveness gives us is a fresh start. And the third thing that forgiveness gives us is a fruitful ministry. And I don't know about you, but I want a fruitful ministry. I don't want to be one of the branches that has cut off the vine and thrown into the fire. I, I want to be fruitful. You know, back in biblical times, if a tree didn't bear fruit in just three years, they want to know what they do. They cut it and threw it in the fire. Amen. I, I'm not trying to be an unfruitful tree. I'm not trying to burn in the fire. I don't want to preach just so people can hear me talk and tell me, man, that was a wonderful sermon. I want soul saved and life changed. I, I want to be fruitful. I don't want to just stand in front of my students and entertain them. I want them to be better readers, writers, and mathematicians because of the time I spent with them. I, I want to be fruitful, but I, I don't want to be fruitful for me. I want to be fruitful for God. Here is how we make a ministry fruitful. First, we make the ministry fruitful by framing it around God. Amen. God must be the focal point of your ministry. Think about that for a minute. When you put a frame around a photograph or a beautiful piece of art, no matter how wonderfully crafted the frame is, the frame is not the focal point, the photograph or the artwork is. You don't want the frame outshining the picture. If that's the case, you why bother putting a picture in the frame, amen? You can just hang up the empty frame. You have to keep the main thing, the main thing, and the main thing in any ministry has to be God. Take it from me. I made the mistake of creating a ministry around me and the moment I left the ministry, the ministry died because it was Brian's ministry instead of God's ministry and I will never make that mistake again. So how can you avoid that? First, you make Jesus Christ the focus of your ministry. Then you build a team around you with the same mindset that this is not about us, but it's all about God. Then you train up one, two, or three people to take your place or fill in the gap when you're there. The ministry should be able to operate without you there. Amen. If I leave and take a little vacation, Second Community Church should be all right. Amen. And I know you will be all right because you went 18 months without a pastor. Amen. And you did. It's just fine, amen? So you got to build your ministry so it's not all about you, amen? A fruitful ministry must be framed around God, amen? A fruitful ministry must be framed around God, and a fruitful ministry must include fostering relationships. Everything in the world is built on relationships, whether those relationships are good or whether those relationships are bad. But in order to have a fruitful ministry, you must be willing to foster relationships. This means that you will have to put others' needs before your own. This means that you have to think about others before you make decisions. This means that you will have to genuinely care about other people because as John Maxwell says, no one cares what you know until they know that you care. I, oh, we should do this. Oh, we should do that. And they're like, he don't know nothing about me. He don't know I'm going through. He don't know the pains I've experienced. And he just want to do, do, do. You got to get to know your folks. You got to build those relationships. Yeah, amen. And when you foster relationships in your ministry to the point that everyone is on the same page, one accord with the leader they will, that knows that he cares, there are no limits to the success that this ministry can accomplish. Let me say that again because I got a little tongue twice tied. Blah, blah, blah. <laughs> When you foster these relationships in your ministry to the point that everyone is on the same page, 
on one accord with a leader they know cares about them. There are no limits to the success of the ministry. And you know, this happens every year, usually in a school setting. You know, I use the school a lot because that's what I do. You no, know, a principal have this big idea for a vision. Oh, this is what we're gonna do this year. We're gonna do this, we're gonna do that, we're gonna do this. And we're looking at them like, he didn't even ask me how my summer was. He trying to sell, you know, he didn't even ask me, you know, how my kids are. You know, we, we getting a little place, we getting a little place. And we didn't hear nothing he said or she said because he didn't show that he cares. You can have all the knowledge in the world. But if people don't know that you care about them, they don't care what you know. Amen. And I tell you what, you can, you can not know much. And your people know you care about you. And they'll follow that little bit you know. Because <laughs> I know, you know, he's going to call me, he's going to check on me, he's going to ask me, but that goes a long, long way. And that's how you make your ministry fruitful. So a fruitful ministry uh, must be framed around God. It must include fostering relationships, and it must include fulfilling your call. Because if you're not operating in your gift and doing what God has called you to do, <laughs> you are wasting your time and the time of everyone around you. God did not forgive you, free you, and give you a fresh start so that you could be unfruitful in a ministry he didn't call you to. Mm. So make sure that whatever you are doing, you are doing it because that is where God has called you to be. And if you don't know, just ask him. And he'll tell you. And, and here's the thing. You don't know, you know, I was sharing with the ministry yesterday. That, that's one of the biggest problems in the church. Not our church, but in the church universal. We let people operate in gifts they should not be operating in. Oh, Sister Jones been teaching Sunday school for 13 years. And she got the same two members. Sister Jones don't need to be teaching Sunday school. <laughs> Maybe she should be usher. Maybe she should be in the culinary committee. Maybe she should be doing something else. But because we want to hurt people's feelings, we let them operate somewhere where they should not operate. Amen. And I told we talked about that too. We have to admonish one another as saints of God. We got to let them know when they're doing wrong or when they're doing stuff. They so that's our job as Christians wow. to hold one another accountable. And that's what makes the ministry fruitful. Amen. Yeah. Okay. If not, they're going to be that branch that's cut off and thrown into the fire. Mm -hmm. and the thing is, you know, many of us know what our gifting is. And if you don't know, just, just ask it. It'll tell you. But, but I'm pretty sure that you already know what God wants you to do. You just haven't done it yet. We got to be like Nike and just do it. Call to preach, just do it. Call to teach, just do it. Call to dance, just do it. Call to usher, call to organize, call to give, call to clean, call to cook, call to sing, call to play an instrument, call to lead. Just do it. Amen. In order to have a fruitful ministry, you must be willing to fulfill your call. So I'm making my decision to make a declaration of dependence on God today. Is anybody going to join me? <laughs> And the first thing that I'm dependent on is his forgiveness. His forgiveness gives me freedom. His forgiveness gives me a fresh start. His forgiveness gives us a fruitful ministry. Today is our dependence day. Amen. And every day is our dependence day because every day I, we, all of us are depending on God. So give God praise for your independence. But give God even a greater praise for your dependence, amen? I don't know about you, but I depend on God. I, I depend on Emmanuel. I depend on the Savior. I depend on Jesus. I depend on Yahweh, El Elyon. I depend on Jehovah. I depend on Jesus Christos. I depend on Adonai. I depend on the balm of Gilead. I depend on the rose of Sharon. I depend on the bright and morning star. I depend on the friend that sits closer than a brother. I depend on the fountain of living water. I depend on the God of all comfort, the God of all grace, the God of all hope, the God of all peace. I depend on the God of my life, the great I am that I am. I depend on the Father, I depend on the Son, and I depend on the Holy Spirit. And that's why we say, I need thee. Oh, I need thee. Every hour, I need thee. Oh, bless me now, my Savior. I come to thee. Come on, y'all know what I need thee. Oh, I need thee every hour. I need thee. Bless me now, my Savior. I come to thee. I can't do nothing yes. 
unless I come to him. Because I need him. I depend on him. I know if I fall, he's right there to catch. Remember we used to do that trust test back in the day and somebody was standing behind you, fall back into their arms. I know I can fall back and he's going to catch you no matter what's going on in my life. I can depend on God. And I know that that dependence comes with forgiveness. Amen. And he's going to forgive me. And he's forgiving me. And he's going to forgive you. And he has going continually consistently forgive you, amen, because he loves us, amen? And that's a beautiful thing to know that God, and, and here, don't get it twisted, because I, I know, you know, when you start talking like this, Minister Michelle, people get that thought, I might as well just go ahead and do it, because he don't forgive me anyway. <laughs> Two thumbs down. We don't live our lives that way, amen? We, we don't take God's forgiveness for granted. Amen. And plus, you know, you got to come to God with a sincere, sincere heart. Right. So if you're going to some sin and thinking, I'm just going to sin because God's going to forgive me anyway. I don't think he's going to forgive you for that because he knows your heart ain't right. Because when you really ask God for forgiveness, you broke. You come from a broken, broke down. If you don't forgive me, I'm not going to make it type sick. Oh, yeah, I'm just going to go ahead and rob this bank because God's going to forgive me. Where you get that money from? I got to rob the bank. God forget. No. That's not how it works. You know, we're trying to live this life the best way we can. And if so, it happens that you make a mistake. Right. Right. That's when we come to the Lord and ask him for forgiveness and he forgives us. We don't just have this. Y'all know, we don't just take this lighthearted and just, oh, I'm just going to mess. Oh, it's all right. You know, if I cheat on my taxes, then you know, God don't forgive me. No. We got to be trying to be as much like Christ as possible. Amen. You know, he knows he's going to make mistakes. That's why. That's why he forgives us. But he ain't saying go ahead and live the way you want to live and just ask me to forgive us that Saturday night before you come to church so you can act holy. <laughs> <laughs> live like a devil all week long and then come to church and be a saint all Sunday. No. <laughs> Let's try to live right seven days a week. 25 hours a day, you know, let's, let's try that, see how it works. Y'all with me? Who with me? Yeah. <laughs> I need to see all your hands. <laughs> Elijah. Yeah. Let me have show you my hands. Anyway, I ain't even front you out like that, but hey. It's all good, you know I love you. But if you, you know, that's, that's what it boils down to. We have to be trying. Every day and every moment of every day mm -hmm. to be trying to be as much like Christ as possible. And, that, and, and that's what being a Christian is. You know what mm -hmm. I mean? And then when you depend on him, when you're dependent on him, it'll make it a little more easier. The problem is we try to do it. I started off with this. <laughs> we try to do it on our own. You can't live holy on your own. Amen. I mean, that's why we get saved in the first place. Because we couldn't do it on our own. So why would you get saved and try to go back to trying to do it on your own? Mm -hmm. Not only can you not do it on your own, you don't have to. Mm -hmm. Amen? Amen? You don't have to. So, I mean, that's like, you know, you got a new car, but you decide to drive the old one. What you get the new one for if you're going to drive it? You got a new life? Live it. Mm -hmm. And live it with the power that God has given you to live it. Amen? Amen. And then he'll bless you. Amen. Amen. And you'll be able to, you know, it gets easier the more you do it. Amen. You know, you know what you, you know what you struggle with. The more you don't do it, the easier it gets. Amen. But you need his strength to get over the hump. Amen. Amen. And to keep you. Amen. 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 Let us pray. Dear gracious and eternal Father, we thank you. And we praise you and we glorify your name. We give you all the honor and we give you all the glory. We thank you that we can declare today that we are fully dependent on you. Hmm. We need you. We can't survive without you. It would even be safe to say that we are addicted to you. We need our daily fix or we cannot make it. So I praise you, I glorify you, and I give you all the glory. And I thank you for forgiving us of everything that is not like you. And I pray that you give us strength in every area of our lives to continue to try our best to be as Christ-like as possible. It's in Jesus' name we pray.